תפחד. אני אמין תראה. כאן הכל בחן. אוקיי. הלו, אברואן. We're going to start the session. Welcome to the last session of the first day, or maybe the pre-wine session. We're not sure what Prof. Delgado is going to give in terms of the wine here. In any case, so the first speaker is Prof. Delgado. Okay, thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you to the, to the organizers, uh, Simon and Emmanuel, for this wonderful conference. And also, thanks to you for coming to this last session, okay, after so many. Then I'm going to talk on, this is a joint work with my PhD student, Julius Vainora, from Lutenia. And I'm going to talk about the Pearson test for conditional distributions. This is the line of the, of the talk. Uh, I'm going to present, first of all, uh, what has been done for peace in, in terms of Pearson tests for conditional distributions. Oh, yeah, okay. okay, okay, great. Then uh, I'm going to, to, to propose a class of partitions for pivotal Pearson statistics that has not been pro uh, proposed yet. Then I will present the Pearson statistic with estimated parameters some recommendations for choosing partitions within this class, some simulations and conclusions. Then what about the Pearson test? Well, this is a little bit old-fashioned, of course, because the paper, the first paper was published in 1900, okay? Um, well, it's recognized in science, in one special volume, of one of the 20 most important discoveries in the 20th century, okay? But not because of the Pearson test itself, but it, it, it is understood that the Pearson test starts the modern uh, statistics, more or less. Okay. Then you have over there the other 19 uh, uh, contributions, like non-Newtonian physics, okay, or I don't know, many, many, many uh, important contributions. What is the purpose of the Pearson test? Just checking whether a random sample is distributed according to a particular model. And the method is very simple. That is, data is partitioned into n classes, okay? And the test evaluates that the difference between observed and expect frequencies in each class arose by chance. This is the Pearson test. Then the Pearson tests are still a basic tool in any research involving data. Then, uh, what about the classical Pearson test? Suppose that we have this uh, vector, this random vector, y is some dependent variable, and x is going to be the vector of explanatory variables, which are IAD uh, according to some particular random vector, that is a, uh, IAD is, a, an, uh, is a random sample. Then we are going to use the typical notation, I mean, uh, that is, uh, F is going to be the joint distribution, this is going to be the conditional, and this is the marginal distribution of the effect. Then, of course, we can represent in this way the joint distribution of Y and X in terms of the conditional. And the null hypothesis in the classical case is that the joint distribution belongs to some particular parametric family indexed by some parameter vector, okay? Then the null hypothesis can be expressed also in terms of some unknown parameter, theta zero, that is that uh, the joint uh, distribution is going to be equal to at theta zero, I forgot here the theta zero, for all yx in this, uh, in this, uh, in, in the Euclidean space. Then the only test is able, in principle, to detect all the alternatives of this form, that is, any uh, negation of the null hypothesis, which can be written in this way. But the Pearson tests are more modest in the sense that given a partition, 
of this Euclidean space, a partition like this. The Pearson test, type of tests, detect this type of alternatives. I mean, I mean the alternatives such that the probability that the data is, or the, 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 the vector of random variables is in a particular cell is different to what we predict in using our model under the null hypothesis. Then this is the, the idea of Pearson tests, that the Pearson tests are created in order to detect this kind of alternatives. Okay? Then if the, if the model is fully parametric, everybody knows this nice formula for the Pearson statistics with the O hat are the absurd absolute frequencies and these E CMs are the expected frequencies when the joint uh, distribution is identical to the parametric distribution under the null. Okay, for some zeta zero, which is going to index these expected frequencies. Then, under the null hypothesis, we know that these uh, Pearson statistics converges to a chi square with m minus one degrees of freedom. This is the result of Pearson. Then Fisher, in 1922 and 1924, he, did, he, he found that the, the, the Pearson statistics evaluated at some estimated parameters converges to a chi square with n minus p minus one degrees of freedom when the parameters are estimated by multinomial maximum likelihood or, for, or using minimum chi square. And also, if we used the, the maximum likelihood estimator, this theta hat is the maximum likelihood estimator, then this is going to convert to a weighted sum of n minus 1 independent chi square with weights dependent on theta 0. This is the result by Chernoff and Lehman, where this theta hat is the maximum likelihood using raw data. Then in this case, the critical values are between the critical values of a chi square with m minus p minus 1 degrees of freedom and a chi square with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. This is what we know. And then, of course, because it is nice to use the maximum likelihood estimator using raw data, then, uh, and, it is, uh, and we don't have a pivotal distribution using the maximum likelihood, some people has proposed to use world tests, which are quadratic forms in the difference between observed and predicted frequencies, okay? And, of course, uh, this uh, quadratic form is weighted by a generalized inverse, which is some estimator of the asymptotic variance, okay, of this difference between the observed and the predicted, uh, uh, the, the predicted, um, uh, uh, frequencies. Then under the null hypothesis, the chi square estimated uh, using any any uh, square root and consistent uh, parameter, okay, then this converges to in distribution to a chi square with degrees of freedom the rank of the asymptotic variance. Okay, and this rank is n minus one when these parameters are estimated by maximum likelihood. Here I have some references for these results. Very good. Then what happens our problem? What is our purpose? Our purpose is just to propose a new test when uh, the null hypothesis consists, on specify, uh, consists of, of proposing some specification for the conditional distribution. That is, now under the null, the conditional distribution follows some parametric family. And this is equivalent to say that this, the joint distribution belongs to some semi-parametric family. The semi-parametric family is this one here, where this marginal distribution of the axis is a nuisance function. Okay? We are not interested in, in that. That is, is not specified. That is, we don't have a full parameterization of the, of the joint distribution. Of course, now, if you look at these expected frequencies here, okay, when theta is known, 
this is deterministic. That is, this is not random, okay? But here, the expected frequencies must be estimated. This is the estimator of the expected frequencies when f, uh, the conditional distribution, is equal to the conditional distribution evaluated at theta under the model under the null. That is, we have here the expected frequencies, which depends on data in this case, which can be expressed also in terms of this integral, okay, with respect to this semi-parametric estimator of the joint distribution, okay, which is semi-parametric. Then, if we use this notation for the vector of expected frequencies, then uh, we have the following. Of course, we have, uh, in the literature, we have some omnibus tests proposed by Andrews in 1997. And also, I have a paper with Winfred when we propose a, 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 pivotal, a, a pivotal test using some Kamalashi transforms, okay? And, of course, the, the Andrews test with estimated parameters must be implemented using some parametric bootstrap. Okay, it's necessary to approximate the critical values using bootstrap. In, there are some world tests in the econometric literature proposed by Hedman. This test proposed by Hedman is not really a test for the... The hypothesis, the, I, I mean, it's not a, a test for the hypothesis of a conditional distribution. It's a test that the test departures when for some marginal distribution which is compatible with the, with the conditional distribution under the null. You know, that is, and, and at the end of the day, he's, uh, he's testing in the direction of the marginal compatible with the conditional distribution under the null hypothesis. Then this Horowitz, uh, Horowitz uh, proposed uh, a world test with some general partitions, but just for the conditional logic model, I mean for the uh, uh, binomial regression. And Andrews generalized uh, this test for general partitions, general classes. And the test has this form, that is, this is the, the application of the, of the world test for this case when we are estimating, I mean, we are estimating the, the, expected, uh, the, the expected frequencies, okay, with this, okay? And uh, Andrews uh, has shown that this converges also to a chi square with degrees of freedom, the rank of the asymptotic variance and covariance metrics of the difference between the observed frequencies and the estimated frequencies. That is, this result is almost identical to the result that we have seen before for the classical case. The only difference is that we have here estimated frequencies, okay? And this introduces some technical complications, but everything is the same. What happens that the Pearson statistics has not been considered yet in this situation, okay? What we are going to do here is just to propose a pure <coughs> Pearson statistics. Yes? Is it really n to the minus 1, or should it be n? Uh, where? Uh, no, 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 because uh, I have not divided this by anything. Ah. Add, add your observed frequencies as sums. Okay, okay I, must, I must divide it, otherwise it goes to infinity. Okay, I must divide. That is, I'm using, I use this notation because it's the, the traditional notation for the Pearson test. I think it's nice to use observed and, <laughs> and estimated frequencies. Okay, it's, it's n minus 1. Very good. Okay, then remember that this is the, this is the, statistic, the, the, the Pearson statistic. The, the, but however, the difference now is that this is are estimated, okay? Are, are, are random, depends on the sample, okay? Then we have here the conditional, uh, the conditional, these conditional probabilities, and here we have these marginal probabilities, which are going usually different. I mean, the joint probability, this is the conditional probability that the vector yx belongs to this class, and this is the marginal probability. These two probabilities are different, okay? Then these denominators 
over here, I divide by n because they were <laughs> not divided by n, okay? They converge to the expectation, of course, of these conditional uh, probabilities, and this is equal to that, okay? But look what happens if, uh, I, I suppose you remember this, uh, this algebra for the, for the Pearson test, okay? When you look at the covariances here, the covariances are a little bit ugly, you know, because we have this expectation of this product of conditional uh, probabilities, okay? That is, this is not the, like, the, the, usual, uh, the usual formula, okay? This is why if, if we express the chi-square statistic in this uh, vector notation, this is another way of writing the, 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 the Pearson test. It's easy to see that these things, of course, converges to the expectation of the observed uh, frequencies under the null hypothesis, which is equal to that. And then we have also here this vector. This is the vector of conditional probabilities that, uh, of, of belonging to this, uh, of, to this of these classes. And we have that this converges to a multivariate normal with this particular variance and covariance matrix, okay? which is not nice at all. Hmm? Then what happens? That the chi-square is going to converge to this quadratic form in this matrix, where these sets are independent uh, standard normals. Okay? It's a vector of independent standard normals. And this is the matrix that we have here. Okay? Of course, this is not the identity matrix, and this is unknown. Okay? In general, what is the challenge? Consists of finding a partition C such that this is independent of rank n minus j for some j. Okay, that is, we we want to find some partition such that this chi-square evaluated at the true parameters converges in distributions to a chi-square with n minus j degrees of freedom. Okay, this is our challenge. Okay, of course we have a trivial case. The trivial case is the classical one, of course. That is, if the conditional probabilities are equal to the marginals, no? then we have that this matrix is equal to this. That is, with the, 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 here I have a marginal, and here I have marginal, before I have the expectation of the conditional here. Then this is equal to the identity matrix minus this square root times this square root, this square root is just the vector of square roots of the probabilities, like in the classical case. And this transpose trace this is equal to one. Then at the end of the day, this uh, sigma c, this is not sigma c, this sigma c is the identity matrix minus this, which is an independent matrix of rank n minus one, because it's easy to see that the trace of this matrix is just n minus one. Okay. Then this is the classical case. This is not interesting at all. It's trivial. Okay. However, using the ideas in, in my paper with Winfred, we are using a different class of functions. It's this one. We, we use this idea in, in, in this paper. Okay. That is, we are using classes which, depends, which depend on the parameters. Okay. Like in the classical case, when you use quantiles. However, we are not using here marginal quantiles, but we use uh, conditional quantiles. Okay? In, in other words, this is our class of functions. Okay? And when we are using the following partition here, we have the conditional integral transform of y given x. Okay? And we create a class, uh, I mean uh, classes, which are numbers between 0 and 1, for this transform, uh, 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 for this transformation, and we are using any partition, no particular, uh, no, no necessarily Cartesian sets, for the exit. Okay, and then we are going to do this kind of thing. Essentially, we are doing the following: we are transforming the data using the conditional transform, and we are using a, pra a, a partition for this transform. Uh, a, a dependent variable. And then we are using a different partition for the x's, two partitions for each one. 
And this is the partition that we are using, okay? We have to assume in order to derive the asymptotic distribution that the conditional, uh, the, the conditional uh, distribution under the null hypothesis evaluated at the uh, true quantiles for this VL, given X, this is continuous on, uh, in, in the Vs and in the parameter space uh, with probability 1. Then what is the Pearson statistic? That is, if we translate the formula that we had, this is the formula for the Pearson statistics in this situation, okay? Where here we have the, the, uh, the observed frequencies, and here we have the expected frequencies, okay? But what happens that this, this thing here, which is the integral that we had before, it can be expressed in this form, okay? Of course, here I, I have to take uh, this, uh, this conditional. Uh, uh, this is going to be equal to this. Okay, possibly this is. Uh, I think this is not necessary. But anyway, what happens here? If you look at this formula, is that when theta is equal to theta star, then this formula here, this is going to be equal to to this. Okay, times m. Okay, and then we have that this can be expressed in this form, okay? That is, when theta is equal to this theta star, then the expected frequencies have always this form. And this is very nice because, that is, this is the statistics that we can use for the null hypothesis. That is, this is going to be equal to this, okay? This is the frequencies of Xs, okay, in the class A that I have defined for all theta in the parameter space, and this PL is just the, the length of the interval, okay? Okay. Then, this is uh, essentially what we, are doing, what we are doing is the following. We are making a contingency table by grouping this transformed variable into these classes, and on the other hand, we are grouping the axes in these classes. And once we have grouped the data in this way, the Pearson statistics, uh, this Pearson statistics can be interpreted as a Pearson statistic of independence, okay? Independence between this transform variable and the axis, okay? And then this is what we are doing here because I have only five minutes. I'm not going to, to discuss the algebra, but this uh, is quite straightforward. That is, this is the, the form of the, of the chi square, I mean the the Pearson statistics, and it can be expressed uh, uh, in this way, in, in, in vector form, okay, with these uh, observed variables are equal to this. And then once we have this, it's easy to see that the expectation is equal to this, okay, with this Q are the probabilities of the excess in the, uh, the vector of probabilities of the excess in the different classes, and the variance is equal to this, okay? Essentially, what we have is that this converges now to this vector of normals with mean zero and this variance and covariance matrix, okay? This is very good because on this kind, when we pre-multiply this by this, this converges to this normal with this uh, variance and covariance matrix this is the form of this variance and covariant matrix, and then this is equal to this, okay? This is square root of P are the vector of the squares roots of the different uh, 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 lengths of the vectors BL, mi uh, BL minus BL minus 1, okay? Of course, this transpose times P is equal to 1, and the trace of this matrix is Lj minus J then this matrix is in the in, in independent of this rank, okay? And we have that the chi-square under the null hypothesis it, uh, uh, is going to converge when we have uh, non-estimated parameters to this chi-square with Lj minus J degrees of freedom. Then when we have estimated parameters, uh, we, we can use the, the multinomial maximum likelihood, this one, or the minimum chi-square, which is this one, okay, in order to estimate 
uh, the parameters, and we have proved under the usual assumptions, that is, we have this, uh, this matrix here, which is related to the, to the score, to the multinomial score, that the parameters converge to this. This is the, the group data uh, information matrix. And then the chi, this chi-square with parameters estimated by the, the, the multinomial maximum likelihood converges to the chi-square that, that we had, uh, the chi-square with degrees of freedom, what we had with known parameters minus p. And if we use the other estimator, I mean the minimum chi-square, this is going to be asymptotically equivalent. Then I'm running out of, out of time. And, well, this is another estimator, an equivalent estimator than have, uh, as in the literature. We can also derive the, wall, uh, the, the, the distribution for the wall statistics. Uh, this is easy. Once we know what is the, the, the variance and covariance metrics of this difference, okay? And here we have this stratum, which is related also to the conditional information metrics estimator. In this case, the wall statistics converges to a chi square with JL minus J degrees of freedom. Very good. I have some, something about the partitions that it, we have defined partitions with, the, uh, with equal number of observations in each cell. It means that with the partitions that we proposed, we never have zero denominators, which was a problem in this literature. Okay? The, we have uh, an algorithm for that, for this uh, equiprobable Partitions, also, uh, this is something important that the, we have proved, we have used this reference here, this is an old uh, literature, okay, that using uh, partitions depending on the data, the asymptotic distributions don't change, okay? Then uh, we, have, uh, we have this algorithm, I don't have time to discuss the algorithm, and we have made some uh, simulations where the null hypothesis is a conditional uh, normal uh, distributions with a linear mean, and we have departures from the from the mean and departures uh, from the conditional variance, and also uh, departure from heteroscedasticity and kurtosis. I finish in one moment. Okay, you can see that the, the the size of the test for the Pearson statistics is not bad, but is almost perfect with n is equal to 500. Okay. Of course, for the Kolmogorov-Smirnov test, using Andrew's test, they, he's using bootstrap, parametric bootstrap. This is why this size accuracy is so good, okay? If we go, uh, well, I, I don't have time to, I have some comparison with the, with the Pearson test in high dimensions, and of course our test works uh, better than the Kolmogorov-Smirnov uh, for large, uh, in large dimensions. But anyway, you have here for fixed classes, we have here JL and JL, okay? You have here the results for departures from the mean for two values, for more and less serious departures. Uh, we can say that we can, when we don't make any partition for the J, essentially we are testing the marginal distribution, that is, this is not a test for the conditional distribution, the power is not so good but when we used a, re a reasonable, I mean by reasonable, some number of, of, of cells, uh, our, the power is better than the Kolmogorov-Smirnov for all sample sizes. We have something similar for departures from the conditional variance and also something similar for departures from the skinness and kurtosis coefficient. Then this is my contribution today. Thank you very much.
uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm uh, That's the first time I'm in Trento. Uh, it's very nice here. Uh, <coughs> now, um, uh, the topic is uh, not exactly goodness of it. Uh, it's more under related topics. Uh, uh, this is joint work with uh, Klaus Teltmann, a uh, former PhD student of mine. He is now postdoc at UC Irvine in California. Uh, and we are talking about ridge estimation. So uh, ridge, this is a ridge. Some people actually can walk on a ridge, I can't. Uh, <coughs> uh, but uh, what we are interested in is uh, usually in image analysis, for example, uh, estimating ridge. Uh, and or uh, this doesn't have to be here. It can be on the moon or uh, even in the universe. For example, here one, one thinks there is some kind of filamentary pattern in the universe. Uh, <coughs> uh, but we go back to basics first. Uh, <coughs> and these are just downloaded pictures. Uh, I didn't do this uh, universe uh, stuff. Uh, but uh, we go back to back to <coughs> basics. Uh, um, uh, for us, ridge estimation is based on density estimation, uh, <coughs> and we are estimating the ridge of the density. So we go back uh, to uh, densities. Uh, now, uh, here in a time series context, uh, so we uh, observe multivariate time series. Uh, we assume for simplicity that we have linear uh, processes. Uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, this is just a notation. Uh, we will denote by um, <coughs> fx the marginal distribution of the process. Uh, and then we will also need derivatives. Uh, so uh, p hat is the, uh, the uh, kernel estimator of the density. And we will need uh, multivariate derivatives. Uh, that, that will be uh, denoted by uh <coughs> p hat r. Um <coughs> And so we use uh, normal kernel estimation. Now, of course, density estimation is an old topic, uh, in particular for IID and the univariate. Uh, surprisingly, quite surprisingly, actually, the multivariate case, even IID, uh, has been treated properly only re relatively recently. Uh, then there are results, again, mostly in the univariate case on the short range dependence. And then uh, since uh, <coughs> about uh, two to three decades, uh, there are also uh, results on uh, long-range dependent processes, mainly univariate. <coughs> uh, a long-range dependence, there is, of course, a long, uh, lot of literature about this. I don't have to go into that. Uh, uh, of, um, what I like to do is, is often long-range dependence, and that has uh, practical reasons, but also simply because I like to do that. Uh, <coughs> Uh, now, at the heart of uh, all this is, uh, in, in the context of long-range dependence, uh, uh, the reduction principle for the empirical distribution function. Uh, the, uh, the fundamental paper uh, was by Delling and Taku in uh, 1989, uh, where they looked uh, at uh, Gaussian subordination process, uh, processes and what happens to the empirical process. Uh, and there is a, such a very nice uniform reduction principle. Uh, <coughs> uh, here we are in the multivariate case, uh, uh, so um, we will have, uh, so in Delhi and Taku, you simply have uh, the derivative of, of the <coughs> uh, distribution function. Here we, uh, we take, of course, the gradient, um, and the empirical process is simply the empirical distribution function minus the true value. And for uh, we will have matrices because we are in the multivariate case, and we will R uh, write uh, this uh, mj is equivalent to j to the power minus alpha times m, where m is also a matrix, uh, if uh, uh, this limit goes to the identity matrix. <coughs> so uh, what we'll assume, we, uh, we are assuming uh, <coughs> for the linear process, uh, if you want to get linear uh, uh, long range dependence, uh, we assume that these uh, that the matrices in the, the uh, representation of the linear process, that they decay hyperbolically. <coughs> so that's the main thing. The rest we can drop. Uh, and then uh, one can uh, extend this, uh, the uh, re reduction principle also to the multivariate case. Uh, so what is uh, 
simply very different in the long early case is that instead of getting uh, a non-degenerate process, asymptotically you actually get uh, uh, <coughs> after standardization and even uniformly in X, uh, uh, the process is degenerate because uh, it is uh, uh, proportional to the sample mean. Uh, and the only thing that changes uh, is, uh, <coughs> uh, well, uh, it changes in X, however, that's a de uh, deterministic uh, function. So in this case, it's the gradient. Uh, so the, you have the gradient, uh, which depends on X, but uh, then uh, uh, the, the only stochastic part is the sample mean, so the, that doesn't depend on X. So it's a, uh, it's a strange process. Uh, it's just a, a random variable multiplied with a function. Okay. So that's the very speci special th uh, thing you have under long-range dependence. Uh, now when it comes to kernel density estimation and also estimation of derivatives, uh, this has then uh, very interesting consequences. Uh, <coughs> okay, this I drop. Uh, uh, well, just to just to be sure, uh, we know what the notation means. So we are using the canonical product. Uh, so when you have two matrices A times B, this means you take the first matrix and multiply each other with uh, with B. So <coughs> that's a very convenient way of writing down then uh, multivariate uh, derivatives. Okay. So that's the chronicle product that we use. Uh, so uh, if you uh, take the R's derivative, it can then be written uh, in a, with the chronicle product. Okay. Otherwise, it would be uh, the second derivative is a matrix, the third derivative is then a three-dimensional object, and so on. Uh, that's not convenient, so it's much con more convenient to write it as a vector. Uh, so this is actually basically what the economists uh, call vec. Uh, they make it into a vector. Okay, <coughs> okay so, the, so we simply take the, the kernel density estimator and uh, just take the derivative. <coughs> and uh, this is just a deal. I can skip that. Uh, we will also have the following notation. Uh, we have eigenvalues. Uh, H is the bandwidth matrix. It's a multivariate kernel estimator. So uh, these are the eigenvalues of the bandwidth matrix, and we will have weak convergence in the space of continuous functions uh, uh, from R m to R to the power m to the power R. Uh, R is how, which derivative I am looking at, because uh, that's, uh, that's the dimension of the R's derivative. Okay. <coughs> so what one can uh, then show, and that's the consequence of this uh, uniform reduction principle for the empirical process is that uh, you have uh, two regimes. Uh, in the univariate case, this has been shown by, uh, for example, Chark and Mjellinschuk and others uh, before. Uh, here is uh, simply the multivariate case. Uh, so when you have small bandwidth, this means, uh, uh, the, for in this case, the eigenvalues, the, the largest eigenvalue of this bandwidth matrix converges to zero faster than this power of n, then uh, you have uh, pointwise, so when y is fixed, uh, uh, convergence in distribution uh, in the, which corresponds to the same as, as what you get under IID assumptions. So that's the usual result, but it's pointwise. Uh, how, however, if you have a sequence of large bandwidth where uh, the largest, uh, the smallest eigenvalue uh, <coughs> The, uh, converges to zero uh, at a slower rate than this power, then you have a functional limit theorem. Uh, so this is completely different. It's not pointwise. It's a functional limit theorem uh, <coughs> of the um, kernel density estimator uh, minus its expected value uh, to a certain process. And this process is also degenerate because that comes from that reduction principle. Uh, this process looks like this. Uh, you have some coefficients, but uh, here you simply have m, m is the dimension, you have m uh, IID standard normal variables, and otherwise uh, everything else is deterministic. So it's a, again a degenerate process. Okay. <coughs> um, 
Now the proof uh, is similar as in the related uh, univariate uh, um, <coughs> uh, papers. Um, uh, when you, you can uh, decompose uh, p hat minus its expected value into a martingale component and a, a lo what one can call long memory component. This is by conditioning on the sigma algebra of uh, simply on the uh, past epsilons. <coughs> then the, you can just uh, decompose it this way. So we have these two components. The, the, the Martingale component uh, behaves uh, the way we are used to. So that's the one that would give you this uh, result as under, under IID condition. And the other component, uh, there you can apply the uniform reduction principle. The empirical uh, process comes in and uh, there it can be replaced by the sample mean essentially. And that's why you get uh, that's why you get this degenerate process. You get, simply get this scalar product of the gradient of f with this, and then an integral and so on. That just comes on the way. <coughs> uh, so uh, you you get a reduction principle for kernel density estimators. Uh, uh <coughs> this process actually converges uh, is essentially uh, the same as this. So we get uh, this degenerate process uh, also for uh, actually, any derivative of uh, the kernel density estimate. <coughs> uh, uh, it has uh, interesting consequences for inference. So this is the, in the univariate case, and just r equal to uh, <coughs> zero. So no, I'm not taking any derivative; just the density itself. Uh, so uh, so <coughs> this is just for one data set, and uh, one can look uh, what happens when I uh, choose a small bandwidth and then I increase the bandwidth. So when I, when I take a small bandwidth, okay, then, then it's like this. Uh, so uh, we don't see any functional limit theorem of any kind. But when the, when, uh, <coughs> the bandwidth is large, then uh, you get a very smooth curve because uh, this is just a, a, <coughs> a function, deterministic function, uh, which is uh, s uh, smooth, a function of x in this case. Uh, times a random variable. So the random variable simply shifts this, uh, this way or that way, but uh, you get a smooth curve. Uh, so, so you get a very funny behavior. Uh, the estimated density is also very nice, uh, and uh, you can actually get, give them simultaneous confidence bands. <coughs> Okay, now, uh, so that was density estimation. Uh, now, uh, rich estimation, uh, again, I start with some examples. So, for example, uh, you have a picture of a leaf, and then you would like to estimate these ridges here. This is uh, cotton, the cotton fabric, and you want to estimate those ridges. Uh, <coughs> this is uh, from earthquakes in New Madrid. That's in, not in Spain, that's in Missouri. Uh, <coughs> Then, again, something for space. Uh, these are recession velocities of galaxies. And everyone, again, suspects that there are some ridges. Yeah. <coughs> this is uh, the opposite direction. This is, these are neurons. Uh, and this is from Mars. That's uh, quite interesting because we will fly to Mars soon, uh, I suppose. And uh, these are volcanic rootless cones, uh, which uh, apparently are indications of uh, possibly water on Mars. Okay. So it's quite interesting to detect these. <coughs> uh, now there is uh, there is a vast literature on uh, in image analysis on rich estimation. This is a problem, of course, that's very interesting for, from the point of view of applications. So uh, there is a huge engineering literature, um, <coughs> and uh, also recently uh, uh, this problem has been discovered in the context of topological statistics where you try to uh, discover topological structures. Okay. <coughs> uh, now, uh, the definition of a ridge, first of all. Uh, what is a ridge? Well, um <coughs> you look at uh, directional derivatives. Uh, in certain directions, uh, you should have derivative zero, but at the same time, uh, okay, you can have two kinds of ridges. Uh, in principle, usually a ridge is that you, it's a local maximum in certain directions. So this means uh, that if you look at the Hessian matrix of 
the density uh, and uh, the eigenvalues, then uh, <coughs> some of these eigenvalues where, where you have this uh, directional derivative is equal to zero, uh, they should be negative. Uh, so that it's a maximum. Uh, you could also look at the values, of course, then it should be positive. So basically, uh, uh, a reach point is uh, where uh, you have a local maximum in A minus K directions. <coughs> um, now, uh, so uh, now we uh, come uh, to, to a model uh, that we consider. Um, so we consider the following model. Um, uh, our observation is on a on a manifold mu uh, plus uh, a random error, and this random error will be this linear process. And uh, uh, ut determines how you move on the manifold. Now, uh, the simplest assumption would be that you move uh, iid on the manifold. One can of course uh, uh, modify that, but for the explanation, it's the easiest. Um, for example, you could have uh, ut stationary and weakly dependent, or if you want to move systematically on the manifold, then it would be, uh, for example, rescaled, um, but systematic, we are moving on the manifold, uh, and the errors are uh, simply uh, temporal errors. Uh, now, before I g uh, get to that, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, let's, let's go back to density estimation. That's quite interesting, uh, even in the univariate case. Uh, uh, because uh, we had this uh, uh, functional limit theorem for the kernel density estimator. Uh, <coughs> uh, what does it mean for statistical inference? So, uh, the, the main thing uh, with kernel estimation is uh, how do we choose the bandwidth? Now, what is the optimal bandwidth? Uh, so just for notation, I will uh, write uh, psi n is equal to eta n, which is dot, right? Uh, if, uh, the ratio goes to a, a non-degenerate random variable. <coughs> uh, we will look at, uh, we can choose kernels. Uh, they have to integrate to one, uh, but uh, then we can choose uh, the order of the kernel. So, uh, so which moments are zero and uh, what is the first moment that is not zero. Okay. So new will denote uh, the order of the kernel. And uh, when we then Go back to the uh, to when it goes back to the proof of that uh, re uh, reduction principle for kernel density estimators. Uh, we can see that we can decompose uh, p hat minus p or its derivative minus its derivative uh, into three components. Uh, one uh, c is the bias that was not in the reduction principle because we ex subtracted the, the expected value. And then A was the Martingale component and B is the long memory component. So we have three components. And uh, uh, the, 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 the bias uh, depends on, <coughs> on the um, order of the kernel. So, so uh, uh, H to the power nu, nu is the order of the kernel. Uh, the Martingale component depends also on N A H, but in the usual way. And the interesting thing here is that uh, the long memory component does not depend on the bandwidth. So that's, uh, that's, that's the unusual thing. Uh, and so uh, no matter how you choose the bandwidth, uh, B is always there. Therefore, we define uh, an optimal bandwidth. Uh, well, an optimal bandwidth is uh, the optimal if uh, A and C are, are of smaller order than B. Because B is always there, you can't remove it. So why not uh, choose uh, H in such a way that the other ones are negligible? So that's our definition first. Now, uh, A plus C, that's uh, the Martingale component plus the bias, uh, that's the usual minimization problem we have in, in uh, <coughs> battery selection. We know how to make this minimal. Uh, and so this means uh, we would like that this quantity is uh, little o of this quantity. Okay. Now the question is, is it possible? Uh, but it's, it's not necessarily possible. Uh, so you need that uh, <coughs> if you look at these two, so this has to be larger of larger order than this, then this leads to this inequality. Uh, D, D is the long memory parameter, must be larger than one half minus this quantity. 
Okay. Uh, what does it mean? Well, uh, if you let uh, nu tend to infinity, uh, d is uh, in the range 0 to 1 half, theoretically, uh, but this is uh, always larger than 0. So this is a restriction. But if you let uh, nu, so the order of the kernel, tend to infinity, then uh, the restriction goes away because uh, this will tend to zero. Uh, this will tend to one half, so this will go to zero. So you have no restriction. So in principle, it is possible by choosing a sufficiently high order of the kernel uh, to remove this uh, problem. Uh, so you can always achieve uh, or uh, get get an, um, uh, achieve this that you can have an absolutely the optimal uh, bandwidth. This is, these are just a few pictures. Uh, this shows you <coughs> the higher the derivative, the more difficult it is uh, uh, to achieve this. Uh, on this axis, you have the order of the kernel. And on this axis, you have this function g. So uh, ideally, this function g will be 0. But that's not the case. Uh, but if you increase nu, it goes to 0. Uh, but it becomes harder the higher the derivative. <coughs> OK, now, um, ah, I don't have much time. Uh, so uh, <coughs> five minutes, OK. Uh, so I will rush through this. Uh, so uh, now we go uh, back to a rich estimation. So we, uh, we need <coughs> uh, directional derivatives, and we need uh, the eigenvalues. <coughs> um, uh, there's a, just a little remark. Uh, well, uh, we have to. Uh, assume something about the eigenvalues uh, of the Hessian matrix. Uh, they they have to be ordered, and you should not have uh, two eigenvalues equal because uh, the mapping uh, <coughs> uh, which maps uh <coughs> the location uh, to the eigen uh, vector uh, is then not necessarily continuous. Uh, so uh, that's a little assumption that uh, we, they are not equal. Uh, and then we can uh, prove, uh, using the result from before, uh, 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 we can prove a functional limit theorem for the eigenvalues. So these eigenvalues they depend on the location, uh, so, so uh, on y. And so there's a functional limit theorem in y. Uh, and uh, same for the eigenvectors. Uh, OK, these are complicated things. But the only thing uh, worth no noting is that when you look at the asymptotic process for the eigenvalues, uh, you have these quantities here, uh, which uh, shows you these constants here. Uh, when two eigenvalues are very similar, then this will be very large. So uh, you have more variability when the eigenvalues are similar. Um, then the rich uh, will simply be estimated by <coughs> taking the directional estimated directional derivatives. Uh, so for this, you, ha you had to estimate first these eigenvectors. Okay, so uh, first estimate the eigenvectors, then you can uh, you estimate the, uh, these directional derivatives, and uh, the rich is then uh, the set of points where uh, these are zero and the estimated eigenvalues are <coughs> negative. Uh, or rather, since they are ordered, you just take the the first one, uh, the, the 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 eigenvalue k plus 1, and then the next ones will be negative anyway. So we just uh, choose for the uh, test for this one. OK, and then uh, we have to have a functional limit theorem, of course, for these estimated uh, directional derivatives. Um, and um, well, finally, that, well, that works. Uh, so we have a, uh, if, uh, <coughs> if it's a rich point, then, uh, then you have uh, no centering, so this is a uh, process which has expected value 0. And if it's not a rich point, then uh, you have a certain centering, uh, which then means uh, you ca uh, this, this quantity will go to infinity. Okay. So we can test this. Uh, uh <coughs> so we can uh, have, uh, uh, we are testing two things. Uh, we are testing uh, whether, uh, whether the, the, whether the directional derivatives are zero, and we are testing whether uh, the eigenvalues are negative, or rather the first one. Okay. So we are testing twice. Therefore, we uh, take alpha half instead of alpha, just to correct for that. 
Um, and uh, then we get, uh, yeah, we get uh, confidence intervals. Okay. So uh, I can skip, skip this, uh, just a few examples. Uh, this is a certain model, and you get such, uh, the red line is the ridge, and this is uh, such a confidence intro, uh, or confidence set you get from this. That is another case uh, where you have uh, two rings uh, inside each other, uh, and uh, you get such confidence sets. Okay, and uh, this this example, for example, uh, can be motivated by examples like this. These are goals because uh, that's what we are looking for. Uh, <coughs> and uh, there is, of course, a lot of future work. For example, uh, that's. Uh, I mean, one wants to use this also for topological inference, and uh, uh, it is not completely clear uh, whether the topological structure of uh, uh, of the density is uh, homotopy uh, equivalent necessarily uh, to the underlying uh, manifold, uh, because you, you you are actually you have a density function on top of it. So, uh, but you are, we are looking at the reach of the density function, but actually we would like mu or the topology of mu. It's not, not completely clear uh, whether one can give nice conditions. And uh, in most papers in topological statistics, one just says, let's assume that this is the case. But uh, it is not quite so clear. Uh, then there are some practical issues like data driven bandage choice and so on. Uh, I just want to finish this with uh, some nice uh, other examples. Uh, for example, cell boundaries you may want to uh, find or this is from sea ice pressure. We are looking for such lines. And this, uh, I just like these pictures uh, in high resolution imagery. For example, here, submarine canyon. This is some uh, high angle faulting. I don't know what. Uh, so uh, there are just uh, many, many examples where we can look at these things. Okay, so thank you.